Uh, I thank you all for coming to what is the inaugural session of uh, this uh, this discussion that we're going to hopefully have now over the next couple of years on blogging and the new public intellectual. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz. Uh, I run the Hannah Arendt Center up at Bard College. I'm joined by Francine Prose and Walter Russell Mead. Um, I'll, I'll introduce them in a second. Um, so, as I said, this is the first uh, of our series. We're still figuring things out. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, our, next, our next session is next Tuesday, a week from today, uh, with two, um, two more political bloggers. Uh, Dylan Byers, who's actually a Bard grad, Bard 09, uh, from Politico, and uh, Amy Davidson from The New Yorker. So I hope you can all uh, come back and, and join us next week for that. And then David Frum will be here on April 9th. Um, let me tell you just very briefly uh, how this series originated and, and, and why it's, it's here, hosted at the Hannah Arendt Center from Bard College. Um, Walter and I uh, have been talking for about a year, uh, at least, about how blogging is, is impacting public discourse. Um, Walter, uh, as many of you know, runs uh, the Via Media um, blog, which is uh, one of the most, uh, one of the best and most impactful um, blogs in the country, political blogs in the country. Um, and uh, the Hannah Arendt Center also has a blog, which is something that uh, in a way needs maybe an explanation. Um, uh, and, and so we've been talking a lot about how it's changing discourse, and we thought that this kind of a series that articulated and was reflective on by bloggers about what we're doing and how we're doing it, and how uh, it can benefit the world, but also what the challenges of it are. Um, one thing to, to think about is really what blogs are uh, on a very basic factual level um, or, or, or how they differ or what distinguishes them. And of course I'm going to generalize a bit, but often blog posts are short, uh, shorter than novels. Uh, they're, they are often written quickly. They don't always have to be, but they're usually written more quickly than, 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 than other essays. Uh, they're usually, and not fully, but usually in some way unedited, um, at least not with the typical editorial relationship that you have in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a big journal, political journal or newspaper. They're spontaneous at times. They offer, often are very private or, or personal, so they blur the public and private. Um, there's a loss of the gatekeepers and thus a rise in the kind of equality in who can contribute to a blog. We don't have editors saying, no, you can't write. Uh, anyone who wants to can start a blog. Um, it thus dem democratizes discourse, and it also uh, involves short news cycles, and thus uh, often appeals to short attention spans. Um, and so one might ask, uh, okay, I understand why people blog. Why would the Han Arendt Center be interested in blogging? Um, Han Arendt uh, is someone famous for writing books and long essays in the New Yorker and the New York View of Books when she writes for a more public audience. Uh, she her favorite statement that she would make all the time about what she does is we must think what we are doing. Um, and for her thinking, uh, she says about thinking that when we think we um, are invisible, that we that thinking does not manifest itself outwardly, but actually um, is a kind of reverse impulse to communicate with others. It, it holds us within ourselves. It's a solitary business. And so one might ask, um, well, that doesn't seem to be very close to blogging. So what is the place of thinking and on Arendt's project of thinking and blogging? Um, for Arendt, uh, the answer is, is quite important. Uh, for her, there's two possible answers. One is we should blog, we should retreat. She, uh, she cites uh, a very famous line by Martin Heidegger, her teacher and lover, that the light of the public obscures everything. Uh, so Heidegger would not, not have been a blogger. Uh, for him, the public is, and when we start talking about things and chatting about things at the water cooler, when we start having these kind of informal conversations, we desubstantialize every issue. We, in a sense, over-publicize it and nothing matters. Uh, and Arendt understands that and takes it very seriously, but she also says in an essay, a very very important essay on, on Carl Jaspers, her other teacher and not her lover, um, <laughs> that humanity can never be acquired in solitude. And that to be human, you have to venture into the public realm. 
And she takes this very personally and very and, and, and much to heart. It's one of the reasons she was one of the leading public intellectuals of her time and not an academic who wrote things to be just read in libraries. And so um, we at the Hannah Arendt Center have taken that in the modern age, in the, in the, in the 21st century, and insisted that we are going to try and, in the name and the spirit of her, venture into the public realm um, through thinking and blogging, yet knowing that there are dangers to that and it can often obscure thinking and uh, lead to desubstantialization of issues. And so that's, that's where we come at it from at the Hannah Arendt Center. Uh, we're, 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 we're trying it, we, we think it's important, and yet we're, we're also nervous about it. Um, and so that's the spirit in which, from my point of view, uh, we convene uh, this, this exciting uh, series. So let me uh, introduce the, the people who are going to help uh, discuss this. Um, first, um, over the course of this, it's going to be done in conjunction with, with the Hunter Center and Walter Russell Mead uh, of Via Media. Um, Walter is my colleague at Bard, where he's the James Ch Clark Chase Professor of Foreign Affairs and Humanities. He's also the editor-at-large of the American Interest Magazine. Um, he's written a, a number of very important books. Uh, the, the one that first uh, drew a lot of us to him was Special Providence, American Foreign Policy and how it changed the world. Um, I'm thrilled that he's uh, doing this with us. He's also uh, a, a, a profound student of the humanities, and I know, we, I learned from one of his bios that he uh, used to, won, won awards for translation of New Testament Greek. I didn't know before that, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Very hard of him. Um, uh, Francine Prose, um, who we're thrilled to have as our first guest, um, is, is, is a, is a, a best-selling and an excellent novelist. She's written 16 novels, if I have it right. Um, uh, many are often mentioned, but uh, the two that uh, I know the best and that I think uh, are often mentioned are A Changed Man and Blue Angel, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, she also has written a lot of nonfiction, um, including a recent New York Times bestseller, which actually has a lot of, is one of the reasons we invited her to, to, to speak today, called Reading Like a Writer. Uh, it's a book that we'll be talking a fair bit about today, because uh, it it's, it's about the importance of editing and thinking about your writing, which often might be um, thought to be at odds with blogging. Uh, she's the president of Penn American Center, and and she's, no, I was. you were, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> it's okay. The, the out of date, out of date bios. So, well, it was only a two year term. It was a two year term. She was president of Penn, <laughs> uh, and she's a visiting professor of literature at Bard College. So uh, I'm thrilled to have her, have her here. I'm going to turn it over to Walter and to say a couple words about the series from his perspective and then start the questions. To see, we're going to talk for, a, uh, we have till about 8.30. Um, we're going to ask a couple questions, get a conversation going. If you have questions, please feel to raise your hands. I'll write your name down, and then we will take questions from the audience, and, and, uh, and we will bring you all into it. So I'm thrilled to have you participate. Okay. Well, actually, uh, uh, I belong to a book group of people who just get together once a month and uh, you know, have read a novel, which we discuss. Uh, and we were reading uh, Cranford last, uh, this current month by Elizabeth Gates. I don't know if anybody knows this book. But I thought of Francine and I thought about this, uh, uh, this event while I was reading it because at one point in there, there's a, there's a discussion where one of the younger people, Horrors, mentions that he really loves the Pickwick Papers. <laughs> and then it, it, sort of the stately grand dame, so to speak, of this little village and looks down her spectacles and says she believes that was written in periodicals and uh, you know sort of weekly installments and so it would not be serious not like she's a doctor johnson uh, to which the person who was praising dickens and us quietly so that she couldn't quite hear said how does she think the rambler was published because it seemed, and the connection with Francine is she's written that, she's in, in her book on uh, Reading Like a Writer, there's a wonderful 170 some word Johnsonian sentence that, that, that is really a delight. But one of the reasons that drew me to blogging in the beginning was that as I look back on the origins, I think, of political discourse in our modern world, 
It's in the kind of coffee house culture of England after Cromwell in the early years after the revolution, where suddenly people can, you, you, don't, you don't need to get pre-publication clearance from the censors. And in fact, the economics and the post office had reached a point where you could actually make a living writing stuff up, taking it down to the publisher, who then sends it out by penny post across London. This is how the Tatler and the Spectator were published by people like Joseph Addison, Richard Steele. Uh, later in the century, this is what Samuel Johnson did. Jonathan Swift wrote a lot of his sort of best work for these things that they appeared three times a week, very much like a blog, very personal in their tone. They were not, you know, they weren't trying to sort of do, do the discourse thing with the, you know, fancy review of the literature and all the other sort of tropes of academic learning of the 17th century, 18th century. They were written to be read by intelligent, thoughtful people on issues of the day. They combined the personal with the political. They were often funny and satirical. They, generally speaking, had a pretty solid point. And they became, in the 18th century, one of the key forms of political engagement and persuasion. I would argue, for example, that the Federalist Papers were a blog. They were written, they would post three times a week. They would be sent out by the highest tech available. There were no gatekeepers, there were no teams of fact checkers and editors. They went directly from the mind of the author to the hands of the reader without intervention. And they were, and they were written to persuade and written with a sense of the public. This, to me, is the essence of what bloggers try to do now. And to some degree, the change in the economics, while it's been very tough for a lot of the publishing industry, it's now possible for basically one person with a computer and an internet connection to reach a worldwide audience in the hundreds of thousands. So, and it, it puts, I think, power into the hands of both writers and readers, takes it out of the hands of editors and institutions, which can be a good thing, but can also be a bad thing. And I think it's a profound change in the way the intellectual and political worlds are working, and it needs to be thought about. It needs to, is it, we need to think about what we are doing. So this series, for me, is about doing exactly that. Francine strikes me as, a, as just a great person to, to kick this off because she, in some ways, seems to me a lot of the themes that Francine works about are very kind of favorable to bloggers <laughs> and to blogging. Because in the one, you know, any novelist is going to think about the personal and the political and the way that different layers of discourse have to come together and that a writer has strategies. And that the sort of the idea of trying to, to limit writing to something that academics do for other academics. No, a novelist is one of the few people in our society who still really depends on a public, an intelligent uh, lay public, which is one reason probably so many novelists are having a hard time finding a living, making a living. But that's another another issue. But the same at the same time, Francine is is really one of, one of our great students of language, of close reading. You might say, if blogging is kind of the fast food of the intellectual world, the McDonald's, in, in some ways, Francine is a charter member of the Slow Food Society, <laughs> you know, and is much more, she's much more of a French bistro than a, than, uh, you know, a Kentucky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mind you, there's a kid in Mexi a Mexican American kid in Los Angeles. One of his Anglo friends says to him, "You know, like how authentic is this Mexican food at Taco Bell?" And the Mexican kid says, "Well, you know, it tastes just like the one in Mexico City." <laughs> uh, so anyway, to Francine seems to be somebody who who lives both sides of the blogging thing 
open to the public, mixing public and private, the writing as a political act, but also needing slow cooking. On top of all of this, she's a blogger, so I thought she's kind of irres irresistible. But let me just kick it off, Francis. <coughs> Why does a novelist become a blogger? Well, can you all hear me? Or do I, yeah, I, I'm kind of a novice blogger. I mean, I feel that I'm here under slightly false pretenses. I, I, in fact, I didn't, I didn't read blogs for a long time because I would, you know, a book would come out. Well, especially reading like a writer, and my agent or editor would call, call me up and say, "Good news, the bloggers have picked it up. Whoever they were, the bloggers." And I go, "Oh, that's great." So then I would, of course, Google myself immediately and I'd go, Ch -ch -ch -ch. and I start reading them. And, and it seemed to me that there were only two types, and one was, um, "I'm sitting here with mittens." <laughs> uh, drinking my cup of chamomile tea. There's a Francine Prose novel on my nightstand, but I don't think I'll get to it yet. I have to finish crocheting the afghan. That, you know, there's a, and, 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 that's, that's a Cranford blog. That's a Cranford blog. <laughs> it's funny she puts down Dickens. I mean, we'll never. Anyway, so, uh, and then the other blog was like, you know, that commie, expletive, expletive, expletive. <laughs> I wish she would expletive, expletive. And then it was like, you know, someone should break all her fingers so she never writes again, expletive. And, the, and, and those were the two kinds of blogs. And I thought, you know, I, I can't. I just can't. So, um, so, I can, so I was sort of insulated or isolated from blog world. And then the way I got into blogging, and, and also I should say, I mean, I write, the only blog I write for now is the New York Review of Books blog. And it's not, in many ways, it's not a, a, block, a typical block. I mean, the pieces are very heavily edited, very heavily edited. They're as, as heavily edited as anything for the magazine. I mean, they go through, it takes four days to write one of these pieces. <laughs> four, I won't say how much money. And, um, and, they're, and, and the editing involves questions back and forth. You might want to think about this a little more. What about this point you raised? Do you want to think about that? And, and so they're not, you know, the idea of the blog as the spontaneous, you know, thought you have that can immediately, that is not what I'm doing, however much I would like to. And actually, I'm glad I'm not, because, because the editor, this guy, Hugh Eakin, who's a wonderful, a wonderful editor, it, it's all the things you want from an editor. I mean, there, those are cases in which I want to think about that thing more, or I want to ask someone to ask the question that I've had. So, so the way I started writing for them was that I was asked, and it was a kind of a long story, but I was asked, to, I was told that I was getting an award from the Edith Wharton House, and, you know, the Mount. Do you remember this? Story, you right, you know, and I went up there, I mean, basically giving someone an award is like how you get them to talk for no money. And so I went up there, and, and I, thought, I thought, well, I should write something about Edith Wharton, and because I'm a huge Edith Wharton fan. So I wrote this little essay that was like 10 things you want to know about Edith Wharton, and, um, and the seventh and the eighth, Edith Wharton was a maniacal, rabid anti-Semite. I mean, off the charts, like on her deathbed, she said, I'll never forgive them, etc. That was a theme. See? Anyway, so, um, so I wrote this in the piece. Well, so I read it there at the Mount, and um, it turned out it was a fundraising thing. I didn't know that. And, and I could look around and see people putting their wallets back in their pockets. So, so no one was speaking to me for the whole weekend. So, so then I had this piece on Edith Wharton with nothing to do with it, and so I sent it to Bob Silvers at the New York Review, and he said, well, they're running something else about Wharton. I said, fine. And then the next thing I knew was I got an email from Hugh saying, well, we want to run it for the blog, on the blog. Well, is that okay? And I was delighted. It's, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a blogger. So, um, so I've since written, I don't know, 10 pieces. I'm, I'm working on another one as we, well, not as we speak, but as more or less we, and, um, and they're all different, and they're all written for different reasons. I mean, some of them are written on assignment, actually, when an article would be written on assignment. Some of them are written out of a kind of passionate need for, I mean, you know, a couple of you here have actually heard the story, but the one that was most compelling to me, and, and in a way the most disappointing, because, you know, there's something about blocking no, I mean maybe you haven't had this experience, but 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 mostly as a writer, you get pretty quickly over the idea that what you write is going to make a huge difference. And, you know, the people are going to say, "Oh my God, how could this happen? I didn't know about it." You know, and suddenly laws are written, changes are made. You know, I feel like I mean, actually the last blog I did for for the review, 
is about the TV series uh, Enlightened, which some of you may have seen. I, mean, I don't know, but, but it's particularly painful to me to watch. It's a very painful series, but, but Amy, the hero, heroine, protagonist, keeps, every, you know, she says, every time she finds out about something, she works for this horrible corporation in Southern California. Every time she, she finds out about how bad they are and they're polluting the atmosphere, she goes, someone has to know about this. And every time she says it, my heart just, I just shrink because I've said it, and I've said it in the same hopeless way that she said, <laughs> useless. Anyway, so, um, so for example, one of the blog pieces was about, uh, I went up to, uh, to teach at a school for a, day, a couple of days in the Bronx, and I found out, you may all know this, that, um, that you know, there's a ban on cell phones in New York City, and students have to, and which is only enforced in the schools of metal detectors, of course. So students in those schools have to check their cell phones. So this, so a company started a, a service, so-called, that, that students can check their cell phones for a dollar a day. These are students who are poor enough that they're on the free lunch program, so they don't really have a dollar a day, but they need their cell phones because they're always getting mugged on the way home. So, um, so this guy has started this business, and he makes $45 million a year oh. checking students out. Yeah, thank you. That's what I said. <laughs> you know, he made the next $23,000 a day. So I thought, I'm going to write a blog about this, because no one seemed to know about it. And I really had the idea, I really still, knowing what I know, had the idea that the many people found out about it, it was going to change. Bloomberg was going to read this. <laughs> Bloomberg was going to read this, and you know, because the parents, the PTA wanted to do something about it, but the schools weren't. You know, I mean, I don't even want to speculate, and I couldn't come up and graft and go. So, um, so, so there were pieces like that, and then there are pieces that I write on assignment, and and Hugh Egan is kind of has a kind of sixth sense. I mean, at some point he emailed me and said, I, I, I assume you're a big fan of Michael Haneke's films. I thought, how does he know? You know, not everybody knows. <laughs> and uh, he said, go see him more and, and, and write about it. And I was very glad. I was very, and again, I was very glad to have a chance because it seemed to me that no one was saying the most obvious thing about the film, which was it was torture to sit through, and it ruins your joy in life for the next couple of weeks. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I mean, <laughs> Oh, it's horrible, horrible. I mean, a masterpiece, you know, but horrible. So, so, so all of them have been different. I mean, now, I, as I said, I just did one about enlightenment, one up, and now I'm doing one that the, the review is doing a series about dreams, and um, and I just did one about dreams and literature, like famous dreams, and you know, Anna Karenina, Don Marshall's, blah blah blah. So, but again, these are assignments. They're not some of them. They're not spontaneous at all. I mean, you know, but but I also want to say that for me it's kind of it's kind of a dream come through because come true because for years I've been thinking, you know, I have this idea, I've seen something, I've heard something, I've read something, I've seen a film, and and I have an idea about the film that I want to be able to talk about. It's not a four thousand word essay. It's just not. It's a fifteen hundred word essay. And I and it's not going to be it maybe won't be interesting to me in the three month lead time that it takes for a magazine for a piece to come out. It's interesting to me now. And, and I thought, gee, I wish there was somewhere I could write this for. You know, and, and also these pieces are personal in a way, even though they didn't seem personal, because they're not, you know, they're mostly cultural pieces, but they're not about, they're not criticism in the traditional sense. I mean, I'm sort of, I've gotten kind of over criticism, even though I do a bunch of it, because it's, there's a formula involved. I mean, you know, you have an introductory paragraph, you say what the book is about, you say what you like, you say what you didn't like, and then you have another paragraph and then you're out of there. Well, you know, you can have some fun with it, but not that much fun. But, but a, a blog, it's more, to me, the ones I've been writing have been much more about the experience of reading a book or the experience of watching a film, which is much more personal, but it's not within the bounds of traditional con conventional criticism. So uh, so I've, I've been able to do that, which has been a great pleasure. So, you know, and, and it's just wonderful to be able to, to have an idea about something and email someone and say, can I write about this so that other people can read it? And, and they do, and they will. Well, that I think is, you know, it's getting to, at its best. Blogging is reviving the personal essay that had been, which is a form that had really almost been strangled out mm -hmm. of 
uh, places. I mean, you, you go back and you read, say, the collected works of Auden, and they're full of things that today could only be published on blogs, if at all. Because they do, they cross these lines of, of the personal, the professional, Criti it's criticism, but it's him. Virginia Woolf, I mean, the common yes. reader, it's all full of things, and you can't imagine what would be the audience for those essays today, because they're not, I mean, they start, some of them sort of start out as reviews, but they're not reviews, they're something else. Yeah. Well, this, and, and this, it seems to me, has been the way the intellectual spoke to people. I mean, you go back to, like, Montaigne, you know, and, and the personal essay has been the form in which, maybe it's the most Arendtian of all forms, I don't know, but it's, it is the form where the person of the writer speaks directly to the reader, not you know, and they're, they're subjects and all, but really it's, it's, it's a very personal form of communication. And somehow this kind of technocratic professional ideal, whether it's the ideal of journalism, the ideal of the professional critic or the theoretician of social issues, ideals that all have their value in their place, but somehow we left out this one thing of the human being talking to other human beings. And blogging brings that back, at least that's why I like it. Yeah, and it says your ideas are interesting, can be interesting. You can make your ideas interesting. Someone else might want to read them, someone else might want to. And it's, it's tremendously, whatever the opposite of isolating is, it is, because you suddenly, you can, you know, there's, it's like talking to people. It's yes. like having people to talk to. I'm, I'm interested in, in this question of the personal essay and the persona. Um, you know, Walter said in his introductory remarks that blogging is, is a kind of writing to persuade and a writing with a sense of the public. And, um, and you've talked about how in a way it's freeing you from criticism. And I'd be interested to think about what, what that is that it's freeing you from. But you know, the person is from personare, um, to sound through, it's really the word for the Greek masks that people wore, and they spoke through the, the whole. And it was a mask. And from, from an Arendtian point of view, to venture into the public, as we were saying, is always to put on a mask. And that the personal essay always requires a mask. It's not just, I mean, not everyone in this room can just write a personal essay. You have to have some sort of a, that's going to be read by 100,000 people. You have to have some sort of a, a public mask that you put on. And I'm wondering, um, you know, if you're going to, if you have to have a public, you have to speak in a way that the public, um, that you know, in a way that matters to the public. Well, I don't really believe it's a mask. I mean, you know, in a sense it is. I mean, everybody has a thousand different personalities. So which one are you going to choose to put out there? But it's more like skin it stops you leaking all over <laughs> people rather than a mask. Yeah. But, but, but more than that, I mean, then the, so then the question is tone, oh, maybe. What, you know, what, what's the tone? And, you know, the, there are one, at least one, to my students here. I mean, one of the things I tell my students is, is the way to get over, you know, the, the way to get over the compulsion to write a paper in some strange language that's not your own language, you know, paper is, is what I call it, is to pretend that you're speaking to your friend, your closest friend, your friend who, who understands you completely, and you're telling your friend what you thought of this book or what you thought of this film. And, and I feel, to a certain extent, that my computer is my friend. So when I'm, <laughs> you know, when I'm writing, I have a kind of conversational feeling about it. So it's not, it's sort of the opposite of being masked. It's like, it's, it's something else. It's, saying what I really think about something without worrying to a certain extent about the consequences. So when you talk in your book and in your classes about the power of words, the power of sentences, the need to edit, the need mm -hmm. to, in a sense, not just blurt out onto the page what you would say to your friend, but to go back and rewrite and rethink and recompose what one writes. And so that's different from or the conversation with one's friend, isn't it, or not? No. No. I rewrite texts, Roger. I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't send anything out without rewriting it. I'm like a maniac that way. I'm, I'm you know, completely compulsed. I'm, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, so the, so the I, and, and, and in a way, it's perfectly suited for me, and it's ideal for me to have 
you know, to be writing for a blog that is so heavily edited, right. because I wouldn't, I can't imagine just, I could never put a first draft on there. I just couldn't do it. I mean, temperamentally, I couldn't do it. And so, so yes, it's not exact. It's not. So, I mean, I think I don't think spontaneous and personal are the same thing. I mean, I think you can be very personal without being spontaneous. Right. So, um, so it's all rewritten. It's all heavily rewritten. But I, again, it would be it would be temperamentally impossible for me to do anything. Else. You wouldn't want to be blogging in a way that was. No one could read it. No one could read it. I mean, you know, because because my first drafts are, of anything are barely intelligible. So I'm not going to hit the send button. <laughs> but I think this spontaneity, uh, even with the uh, you know fixing it and trying to make it, because even with your with your friend to say, wait a minute, let me think about this before you speak. But I'm thinking of uh, Peter Berger, who's one of the other people who blogs at the American Interest. Uh, Peter's in his 80s. He's a sociologist, very, very well-known sociologist. He's famous when I was in college, which was a very long time ago. And Peter started blogging for us. Sort of, he writes an essay with religion and other curiosities. He's, he's having the time of his life because it's, it's the first time I've been able to write about something because I wanted to write about it. Only that. That I have a thought, I, it, it, or I have an experience, it brings up a train of associations. And in that sense, I think this kind of writing is letting you, and for someone who's interested, whether you're interested in Peter Berger or just the play of the mind, you get to see what it's like to be someone who for 60 years has been at the top of world intellectual life, who, who thinks in these rich, dense, complicated, and surprising ways, and who is just sort of sharing it for you without a kind of a sense of simple joy of doing it. And this, I think, is a more personal kind of writing. Certainly, he, he works on it. But it's great. Peter knows nothing about the internet and has no desire to learn anything about the internet. Uh, we have gotten him. One of the one of my colleagues, the American Interest, has gotten out of a point where Peter knows how to put a word document in an attachment to an email. That's as close <laughs> as he gets to the process of putting it on the page. You know, WordPress. Don't even draw. <laughs> What's uh, WordPress? Uh, <laughs> that's a program that a lot of bloggers use. Uh, it's word processing for blogs in a way. Uh, but it has been this tremendous liberating, you know, and for AD, Peter is really well known. He's been able, any journal would be glad of what he's written. His, you could place a review anywhere, but no one had said to him, you can write about what you want to write about when you want to write it. And blogging has, has restored a lost freedom to writers. Shall we?